Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm very excited because we have author Marisol here today, and she has written a series of romance novels. And today, she's going to talk about the red flags, how to know when you're dating a narcissist. And she's going to go more deeper in depth about it, and she's going to talk about some of those red flags. So listen carefully. Marisol, it's wonderful to have you back and let everybody know a little about yourself and let's get into this hot topic because I want to know what the red flags are. <laughs> hey, Stacy, it's good to see you again. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Um, okay, well, like you said, I'm a romance writer. Uh, I've written 31 books over six series mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's my full-time job. It's my passion. And on a, a slightly more personal level, as opposed to professional, I was in a relationship with a narcissistic abusive man for six years. The first two, there were some red flags, but I didn't really recognize them totally for what they were. Uh, and so those two years were okay. And then the last four years were really horrible. And I left just over a year ago. And I've spent the past year doing therapy and getting help and reflecting and healing. And I've done a lot of research. I've talked to a lot of people. I worked with a therapist specializing in narcissistic abuse recovery. And I, I, a lot of stuff became very clear to me after the fact, once I was out of the relationship, things that I probably should have seen earlier on. And um, if I saw them again in a future relationship, I would not, uh, I would not continue the relationship. I would not engage. I would be out of there because even if this person isn't narcissistic and abusive, some behaviors are very problematic and troubling. So best to just not expose yourself to them. A hundred percent. You know, I think sometimes when we're in an environment for so long, or you came from an environment, you know, a family life where there was a narcissist, it seems mm -hmm. normal. And in, 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 in our life cycle, we find that many times people look for similar characteristics of their parents and whether it be healthy or not healthy. And they end up, let's say if they had a narcissistic father, they end up with a yeah. narcissistic boyfriend when they should be mm -hmm. running the other way, but yet they fall into the same trap all over again. So well, maybe... sometimes sometimes what's familiar is weirdly safe, even when it's not healthy. So right. that's, that's kind of where the family uh, dynamic can really warp our idea of what is healthy. Just because it's normal and we're used to it doesn't mean that it's particularly great for anybody. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Now, what are some of the red flags? Like when you're in a relationship, you know, how do you start to realize that, hey, you know, this is not normal behavior. I shouldn't be treated like this. Why are they saying these things? Why are they doing these things? You know, maybe I'm in an unhealthy relationship. And how do you realize when that person is a narcissist? Because a narcissist is a, is a disorder, you know, but yeah. it, you know, people don't always recognize that it's a disorder. And people don't really even realize sometimes that they're with someone that's a narcissist. Well, part of the problem with a narcissist is they, they don't actually think there's anything wrong with them or their behavior. They think everybody else is the problem and they're constantly the victim and stuff is just always happening to them and people are abandoning them. And why? Because they're such a great person. And it's very hard for people to understand this isn't like you know, if I do something that upsets my partner and they talk to me about it and they say, listen, I really hate when you leave the dishes everywhere overnight because it just stresses me out. I can't go to bed until the kitchen is clean. And you say, okay, you know, and that's something that you can fix to respect your partner. A narcissist never sees any need to change anything about themselves. And this is the problem is people think they can change the narcissist. They think if they approach the narcissist in a certain way or say the right words or catch them in the right mood and they use the right tone, like whatever, if they just find that magic key and turn it in lock, the narcissist will change. They will not because there is no right way to approach a narcissist because they will not 
change unless they recognize they are a narcissist and go for intensive help and therapy, all the while constantly admitting they're a narcissist. And that's just about the hardest thing for this type of personality to do. But um, you were asking about maybe some of the red flags or early signs. Mm -hmm. And this is the one that I didn't see coming. I, I, I fell for it hard was narcissists will love bomb you. And I had heard that expression before, but I didn't really know what it meant until I looked back on the first year of my relationship with my ex. And I thought, I was love bombed. But at the yeah. time, it feels like this grand sweeping romance. Like I write romance, so I get it. There's this yeah. whole, the stars have aligned and we're fated to be together. And oh, they they seem to be able to read my mind and we have so much in common and oh my God. And, and like the sex is amazing because they're putting all their efforts into it. So you get swept away. And um, that is actually something that we as a society and like in movies and in books and stuff, we sort of say, oh, if this, if this happens, it's true love. It's so romantic, you know, but in real life, it's actually a little bit worrying. You got to just watch for it because yes, you might have found your soulmate. This might be an amazing person and you've just clicked, or it could be a narcissist who's coming in and studying you asking you tons of questions they find out what you like they find out what you love and then they tell you wow i feel exactly the same way about that i also love vanilla fudge as opposed to chocolate that's amazing oh god my favorite place in the world is athens that's amazing oh god yeah and so suddenly all these things that you have offered yeah about yourself because you're getting to know somebody so when they ask you a question, you respond. They take all that on board and suddenly it's like you're so aligned because this is part of the strategy is they convince you that, oh God, you're soulmates, like, oh, everything. We're just, we're in agreement about everything. And they will, uh, God, his big thing was gifts. Like every time I turned around, there was another massive gift coming my way. And that's also nice in a new relationship. But when it's constant, you know, you kind of start to feel this is a little bit weird, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then like the, the other love bombing, the whole thing about, uh, you know, just you're the, oh God, this thing that they say, which is you're the only person who really understands me. We are meant to be together. This is fated. It was destiny. It was written in the stars. When they start to, you know, agree with everything you say and you have everything in common and there's no slippage and they never disagree with you um they never take a stand about anything uh they ask you a lot of really personal questions and you're finding yourself being very vulnerable with them and they're so supportive and you know they're the only one who really understands you um it it, it sounds great but Everybody, even people who are really, really compatible, aren't perfectly matched. There's always something about us. Like, even if you think about your best friend in the whole world, you and she, I'm sure, have differences between you. But right. you love each other and you're respectful and it's a great friendship, right? Mm -hmm. So why, why do we think in romance everything has to line up perfectly? Yes. It really doesn't. Right. It can't and it shouldn't. So if you're in a relationship with somebody, especially right in the beginning, who is always rushing to convince you that they're exactly like you, they feel exactly the way you do, everything is exactly the same, and, it's, and you're perfect. They put you up on this pedestal. And I remember early in the relationship, our first argument that ever came up was I told him that I felt like there was way too much pressure, that I was up on this pedestal and I didn't want to be there because I'm a flesh and blood woman. I'm not clay. Yeah. And he, he hated that. And that should have been one of my first signs that he didn't see me for who I was. He had idealized me and concocted this beautiful, amazing fantasy. But from the beginning, I sensed, I did, and I wish I had listened to my intuition. I felt 
um, really objectified and fantasized. And I should have pushed harder. I should have pushed back harder. But I, I didn't know. I'd never met a narcissist in my life. I was, I was unprepared. And like I said, there's this idea that when somebody sweeps in with grand gestures, it's, it's true love. And I mm. fell so deeply in love with him. But of course, I didn't fall in love with him because it wasn't him. He was some weird reflection of me in a strange yeah. way. So he never existed, the guy I fell in love with. I know this for a fact. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the first things to look out for, especially in the first few months. Look for this love bombing that takes you out of any sense of reality. And if you push back, make a point of pushing back against something he says. If he says, oh, um, I really love steak, make a point of saying, God, I hate steak. I think it's, I think steak is awful. See yeah. what he says, you know, because he'll either flip and say, oh, you're right. Steak is terrible. Yeah. What was I thinking? Or he'll say, what the hell do you mean? What's your problem? And he won't be able to handle you having a difference of opinion. Both yeah. are red flags, you know? So that's just one of the first things to look for, really. <laughs> and it's a small thing, but look for the love bombing. Like, yeah, it's it's pretty extreme. And it shouldn't be extreme. Getting to know somebody should be a slow, steady, respectful process. It shouldn't be um, instant karmic bonding on every single topic. It, that doesn't even make sense because no two people are exactly the same. So how is it possible? Do you know right. what I, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think um, I, you know, for me, I, I know I have people in my life that are narcissists and they will flip, you know, mm -hmm. if I, something, you know, they, they seem to enjoy to rip people apart also. And when, you know, well, I disagree with that. I think this all of a sudden, their opinion will switch, you know, or they'll just shut up because they just, you know, they see that, oh, they're not, it's not going the way I want it to go, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I find that they, they try to put you on a pedestal and yeah. they try to, you're a trophy to them. You're not a human. You're more of a trophy. I think, what do you think? Uh, that's exactly what I said. And <laughs> that's exactly what I said you know it's um it's exactly how I felt I felt like I could do no wrong and his other big thing was he kept telling me that I was out of his league he was punching above his weight um he he was so lucky to have me he couldn't believe that that uh, that he had me after all these years of being so tr treated so badly by other women and other people. And that is the thing that made me uncomfortable. And I remember that's what led to the conversation where I said, listen, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfect. You, you've got to stop treating me like I'm never going to make a mistake because I will. And that's, that's the other thing to look for. It's another red flag in a relationship with a narcissist or toxic person is if you make any kind of mistake or uh, you, you screw up in some way, wow, watch them start to devalue you immediately because you have shattered their beautiful, idealistic idea of who you are. And wow, they will punish you for that rather than saying, I was being really unrealistic. Their, their go-to is it's your fault that you've let me down. My view of you has been shattered, not because my view is wrong, but because you let me down. Um, and that's something else to look for. Watch for the devaluation process as soon as you make any kind of mistake. Yes. And what are some other um, red flags that you find very common in a, in a relationship of a narcissist? Uh, absolutely zero accountability on their part. Uh, everything that you try to, you try to talk to, I mean, in a normal relationship, something comes up and you go to the person and you say, um, can we please have a conversation about something that happened last night? In a normal relationship, the person says, sure, they sit down, they hear you out, and mm -hmm. they can then agree to disagree. They can tell you, this is something I'm not going to change about myself. We've got to go our separate ways if it bugs you that much. Or they can say, I didn't realize you felt this way. Let's talk about how we fix this, right? Those are the three answers. Let's fix it. Let's end it or put up with it. 
you've got a right. choice here, right? Those yeah. are your three choices in every conversation with a significant other, a friend, a family member, it doesn't matter. Um, with a narcissist, there, those three things are off the table. The only response that a narcissist understands when you say to them, I really want to talk to you about something. And you say, you know, um, we had that argument last night and you started name calling me. And I thought we agreed there wasn't going to be any more name calling ever yes. again. You promised you wouldn't do that. Yes. And they say, rather than saying, okay, you're right. I did promise we need to work mm -hmm. on this together. Or they say, well, you know what? I'm not going to stop name calling you. So your move, what do you want to do about it? You want to go? Okay. Or they say, um, well, you know what? I, I've decided name calling is appropriate. So I'm just going to end things because I don't want a relationship where I can't name call someone. They don't do those things. They instead, they turn it around and they say, either I didn't name call you. What are you talking about? Oh God, you're crazy. You must, you're remembering stuff wrong, right? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. one thing. They absolutely categorically deny their own behavior. So there's no accountability because they don't even own it. They don't even say, yeah, I've done it. What are you going to do about it? They just say, I, that didn't happen. So you're yeah. like, and then you suddenly spend the rest of the argument trying to convince them that the thing you're upset about actually happened, which is a right. whole bizarre conversation to have with somebody. Yeah. Or, or what they say is, um, the other way that, that a narcissist will go. And my ex did both of these things, okay? The first one where he just said flat out, I, that didn't happen, you're out of your mind. The second thing they say is, um, well, uh, you know, they turn it around. So somehow you're the person who created the problem. So they say something like, um, oh, this happened last night. God, why are you always living in the past? Why can't you ever let anything go? Why is it that any time I make the smallest mistake, I have to hear about it forever in a day? But you know what? Let's talk about some of the stuff you've done that I've never brought up. Just stuff that I accept because I love you. Okay, I'm obviously better in this relationship than you are. And then they start to tell you all the stuff that you've done that upset them. And suddenly the conversation isn't about this legitimate thing you wanted to talk to them about. Now the conversation is you're defending yourself of, against things that might have happened a year before, a month before. You know, mm -hmm. it might have it might have never happened. It might have been something. And so then you're you're saying it, well, that never happened. What are you talking about? Right. So the conversation with a narcissist where you try to approach them about anything. Anything that involves them taking accountability about anything, anything they've said, done, they will either deny it mm -hmm. or they will turn it around and explain why actually you're the problem. So suddenly every conversation with a narcissist is either they feel that you've been attacked, that you're attacking them. So they turn around and attack you and you're constantly on the defensive. And then if you have the nerve to actually defend yourself and not back down, that's when the rage comes in because you're mm -hmm. defying them. You're, you're not backing down. So then the rage begins. And this is where my ex um, was terrifying because he would throw things, he would break things, he would shout like the rafters would shake from his shouting, you know, yeah. and it wouldn't end. It just wouldn't stop. And um, if I had the nerve to talk back, he just got louder. So what you learn from that, both, both of both things where either they deny the reality and you're in an yeah. argument trying to convince them this did actually happen, or they turn it around and suddenly you're defending yourself or they're shouting at you like we're breaking something or getting physically violent or whatever their sort of, you know, uh, level is. Yeah. All you learn from that is you never, never, never talk to them about anything again that demands they take accountability. Yeah. So this is one of the things about the narcissist. And this is something that's another red flag. If you find yourself approaching in the beginning, you'll approach your partner with confidence because you don't know if they're reacting one of these ways consistently. It's a big red flag. If yeah. you 
um, are afraid to talk to your partner. If something happens and you think to yourself, oh, I should, and then you think, God, no, I am not, because I am terrified at the, about their reaction. Or you think their reaction is not safe. Or you think there's no point, because it's just going to turn into a circuitous BS argument with I'm, I'm the problem. So I'm just not even going to talk to them about it. Yeah. If you are in a relationship with somebody and you cannot go to them in a respectful way and expect a respectful uh, listening response, this is a huge red flag. If you are censoring yourself, if you are pushing down on your own thoughts and feelings and worries and um, ideas to avoid their reaction, you are not in a healthy relationship at all. No, you, you, nobody should censor themselves with a healthy partner. Yes. You know what I mean? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So that's a, a huge, huge red flag. If, if you cannot, I'm not saying you can't have an argument with them. Of course you can, but there are arguments and then there are narcissistic um, manipulations and they are not the same thing. Like a healthy argument is I come to you and I say, I want to talk about this. And you say, okay. And then you respond and say, well, I totally don't see it that way. And then I'm like, well, okay, fine. And you might even raise your voices, but everybody acknowledges what is going on. Everybody agrees on the sequence of events. Everybody says, yes, uh, this is what happened. We just have different views on it. A narcissist does none of those things. And yes. if you're with somebody who can't even have a conversation with you without them losing their mind, going nuclear, throwing something, shaming you, shutting you up, you are not in a healthy relationship. So please, please take that as a red flag. Definitely. Yes. That is so true because it you, it's very hard. A narcissist is never wrong. They don't see themselves as wrong. So, you know, it's, it's very hard to have a healthy conversation and even, you know, and even arguments. It just, it, with a, with a narcissist, they only see one way. And I don't think the word I'm sorry ever comes out of a narcissist's mouth. You know, I don't think I've ever heard those words out of a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that you should look for, uh, sort of a red flag with a narcissist is um, when, because the things with a narcissist can be great, you know, things can be really peaceful, really calm, really whatever. When you realize that the only reason things with a narcissist are fine is because you are not, you are not being open about how you're really feeling about things. Like if the only reason you're having a good day or a good week in your relationship is because you have shut yourself up, right? Um, mm. What you're actually doing is you're managing their feelings. You're managing their emotions. You aren't going to them in an open, honest, vulnerable way and saying, I really want to talk to you about this because you've learned that is not a safe thing to do. So you don't do it. And you know what? As long as you don't do it, that means you're not asking for accountability on their part. And if they're not being held accountable about anything, they're fine. They're, they're happy as a pig in poop, you know, <laughs> because they get to carry on with their life. They get to do what they want. They know you're not going to say anything to them. Like, what are mm -hmm. you going to do about it? And if you do say something, well, they'll just shout, right? So they yeah. win either way. So if you find yourself in a relationship where you are, tiptoeing like walking on eggshells to manage their feelings like mm -hmm. the thing about narcissists is they're just like big kids you know they've, they've got they're big people with toddler emotions and yeah. and maturity so you kind of if you find yourself sort of saying um i really want to talk to him about this i really want to talk to her about this but i know if i do it's going to be hell for three days so I'd better not, um, that is a huge red flag because what you're doing is to keep the peace in your yes. house, in, in your own heart, in your own head, you are shutting yourself up and nobody in a healthy relationship should shut themselves up. And if you're afraid to talk mm -hmm. to your partner, yes. you're not in a good relationship. So that's a huge red flag. I mean, we talk a lot about the red flags to look for in the other person. 
Mm-hmm. But one of the things I found very helpful was to look for the red flags in myself. So yeah. one of the things, if, if you are censoring yourself to keep the peace, mm-hmm. or you are not talking about how you're feeling because you want to um, spare the other person's feelings because you know they're going to lose their mind. Yeah. These are red flags in yourself. Another mm-hmm. thing to look for in yourself is uh, how open are you about the relationship honestly with the people around you? Like yeah. how much, like if you went to your best friend and sat her down and said, this is what happened last night. This is how it went. And you described it or you recorded it and played it to her. And she heard how you went with a reasonable request and there was this explosive reaction and there was glass shattering and then a door slamming and the name calling and everything got turned back on you. And you played this to your friend and you said, listen, what is, is this okay? She would say, oh my God, this is, this is abusive. What the hell are you doing? Right. But we, but we don't tell our friends. We don't tell our family. When they ask how so-and-so is doing, you oh, he's really stressed or he's with work or whatever. You, if you were to go to your friends and tell them the pure unvarnished truth about what's really going on, they would tell you the truth. So why are you not doing that? And this is mm-hmm. a red flag in ourselves, which is yes. we are not honest about what's happening in the relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Because yeah. we know that if we if we talk to somebody about it, chances are they're going to tell us that this is really, really insanity. So we lie to ourselves. We say, oh, this is a private thing, or oh, he's just stressed, or oh, he's overworked, or whatever excuse we want to give, Um, or oh, I'm too sensitive, or oh, I guess I overreacted. And this is where you start to internalize what you're being told. So Mm -hmm. the narcissist will tell you, you're too sensitive. You took that wrong. You have no sense of humor. And after a while, you hear it so much. You start to think, I guess I'm sensitive. I guess I took it wrong. I guess I have no sense of humor. So you stop talking to your friends and family. You just stop telling them anything. Because, I mean, how would you even explain any of this? Because it, it went from the greatest love story ever told, which you certainly told them about, Right. You certainly said he whisked me off to Paris and he bought me this expensive perfume and oh, my God, we're we're so compatible from that to um, I asked him to bring in the laundry and he threw a teacup at me. And it's like, how do you explain this tiny little drip, drip, drip that happened in between that went from the greatest love story ever to I think he's abusive, but I can't. I can't explain it. You know, I can't explain what's going on. So if you find yourself in a relationship where you cannot go to your closest friends and family and be totally honest about what's going on, um, then you have to ask yourself why that is like, what, what is actually going on in this relationship? Right. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's so true. I think it's it's very difficult to live with a narcissist. And one of the things I wonder is, is why is it so hard for so many women to get out of a relationship with a narcissist or so many men ha- have a hard time getting out of a narcissistic relationship with a woman? Mm-hmm. Well, I can only really talk about myself, but what I've discovered over the past year is that um, my story is not unique at all. In fact, I swear there's a narcissistic playbook because... Mm-hmm. When I, when I talk to other women or I talk to my therapist, nothing that I said was singular. They were all yeah. like, yeah, yeah, we got that. Yeah, we had went through that. And what I think, at least in my case, why I found it so hard to get out was because um, the love bombing in the beginning, it made you so convinced that this was your person. This was who you were meant to be with. This was it. And then like the 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 arguments and the gaslighting and the manipulation was so gradual it's not like they went from being the perfect prince charming to this nightmare overnight it takes months if not years for them to fully unmask and then by that point you're enmeshed like you're in a relationship and the thing is it's not like for that time they're the monster all the time they bring back the charming guy or woman 
when needed because they know how to switch it on. So mm -hmm. when you start to look like you're developing a backbone, or in my case, I would look at him, he would throw something and I would just be like, this is, you're having a temper tantrum like a toddler. I don't want a relationship with a five-year-old. Like, yeah. What the hell, you know? And I would say, okay, well, we need to talk about getting out of the lease. We need to talk about dividing the money. We need to talk, we need to talk about all these things. Mm -hmm. He would instantly sit me down, be very reasonable, tell me how sorry he was. A narcissist will say sorry, but it's another tool in their manipulation toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, he will prom He promised me all these things that I've been asking for, all the ways he would change, all the ways he saw his behavior as diabolical. Like he would just pull it out and it would be like the most beautiful apology, something Hollywood would write, you know, yes. mm -hmm. another act, but it would be um, the callback to the person in the beginning, the love bombing person that that person would return and they will behave themselves for a few days uh, right. and it will be wonderful and they'll be romantic and, and it will be emotional and they'll be um, supportive and loving and all these amazing kind. And you'll think, okay, I mean, he gets it this time. I guess we just needed to have that. I just had to, you know, threaten to leave. I guess he gets what he would lose. He doesn't want to lose me. I guess he sees the error of his ways. That's not it at all. It's just, they're offering you just enough hope to yes. keep you hanging in there. Mm -hmm. You hope that they've changed. You hope they've heard you this time. You hope that it will be different from now on. And yes. it is for a few days. My ex could go about a week with the good behavior guy before mm -hmm. the old behaviors would start creeping in. Because yes. in their mind, what's happening is um, she threatened to leave me. Uh, she didn't leave me. So really on some level, she's okay with how I behave really. So I'm going to carry on behaving the way that I have. I'm not really going to do anything differently. And so then the cycle starts again where the behavior start up and you start to see the patterns and then you realize you're behaving the same way. So you, so then either you, um, say, okay, I don't have the energy for this. I just need to, I just want to, I just want some peace. So you shut up or you yeah. push back again. And yeah. then the same thing happens, huge mm -hmm. explosion. And at some point you might say again, all right, that's it. I'm out of here. And then right then, yeah. then they bring it back. So I think the reason that we women, I can only comment about me. We stay in these relationships is because we have hope. They give us hope. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have that hope that the person from the beginning will come back permanently, because yeah. we see glimpses of them, we're going to hang in there. We're going to yeah. hang in there. Uh, it's not until we realize a few things, which is the person from the beginning is fiction. They never existed. Yes. Um, they bring them back as necessary to manipulate. Mm -hmm. It's not genuine. And the mm -hmm. second thing we realize is this cycle, this cycle, is going to continue forever and yes. ever and ever. And one day you just look up, which is what happened to me. One day he was having a temper tantrum, another one, he was throwing stuff. And I looked at him and it was like clear as day. I realized I had been standing there in this exact situation 8,000 times. And there were going to be 8,000 more in the future if I stayed it was yeah. never going to change. It didn't matter what I said. It didn't matter what I didn't say. It right. didn't matter what I did or didn't do. It didn't matter what tone of voice I used. It didn't matter what time of day I approached him. It didn't matter if I had done something or not. It, it, nothing mattered because it was nothing to do with me. Yes. He was always going to be like this. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I realized that, that this was my life, if I stayed with him and I didn't want this life anymore, mm -hmm. that is when you, you finally see that you have to get out and then you're in a whole different situation, which is how do you get away from a narcissist yeah. safely in some way that's healthy for you. But until a person is able to look at the other person, look at their life, look at the patterns, see it all huge picture and say 
this is going to be my life as long as this person is in my life. I don't want this anymore. Yes. Then you're not going to get out. But the second you do, everything changes. Then you realize what you're dealing with, which is a really, really monstrous personality who mm -hmm. has no interest in changing. So if you keep changing, eh, maybe things will be okay for a few days. Yeah. But as soon as you realize that you're not the problem, um, then it's just, it's a few steps to realizing you have to get out. But those are huge steps and they're dangerous steps depending who you're dealing with. Yes, definitely. Now, once someone realizes or once you realized um, that you were in a narcissistic relationship and you saw all the red signs, you know, and you were like, okay, now how did you get the courage and how were you able to pull away and start your life over? Because I would feel that's very fearful. You know, just the fact of having to start over, I think would scare many women and they would, mm -hmm. they would settle for taking the abuse than having to start over again. So mm -hmm. what, you know, gave you the strength to pull away? And how, you know, how did you were able to build a new life for yourself? It's really difficult. And this is where I have so much sympathy and empathy for women who are still in these relationships because um, part of what the narcissist wants is power and control. So they go out of their way to like enmesh you in their life as much as possible. So living together, marriage, kids, in my case, um, it was, I was living with him and my son. I brought my son into the situation. Mm -hmm. So we were both dependent um, on him because I had stopped writing by that point. Gradually over the relationship, I started working for his company and it was very gradual. It took sort of 18 months for him yeah. sort of saying, can you help with a couple of things with my company to me? basically forsaking my own independence and writing and financial freedom and working for his company basically all the time without, not for a paycheck. Cause he kind of convinced me that, well, if we're both working for the company and the company, all the money's coming into the house, well, that will keep the roof over your head and your son's head and my head. It will keep the food in the fridge and the lights on. And in a weird way over that 18 months, I kind of thought, well, this is actually really great. Like we're in it together. It's a partnership. But what it meant was that I had forsaken all of my financial independence. Mm -hmm. So I was utterly dependent on his company to, to provide for us as a household, which meant mm -hmm. that when I got, um, I started pushing back on things and he would, take my telephone, take my son's telephone, take my laptop, um, tell me he wasn't going to give me any money because it was all in the bank account. He was going to throw me out. I was going to be me and my son with no way of communication, right? Also bear in mind, I'm not from where I live. I'm in England and all of my support systems are in Canada and Poland. So it was this whole thing where I didn't really have anywhere to go. My son and I had moved here just before lockdown and we never really connected with anybody properly. Right. So I had nowhere to go. I had no money. I had, I had nothing. I had no job. I had no phone and he was going to kick us out of the house on the spot. So we were even going to be like literally homeless. So when I say that you get trapped in these relationships, I really know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So even when you have a moment like the one that I had where you, you thought, oh my God, this person is a proper monster and I need to get out of here. Your next thought is, how do I get out of here? I'm so trapped. Like I'm so dependent and I've got a son and what happens to us and where do I go? And so what I ended up doing was um, one of the big things I can tell, say about myself is I'm one hell of a planner and I'm very organized and I have the ability to play the long game. Yeah. And this is something that not everybody can do, but it's the only answer when dealing with this kind of personality is you have to start getting very sneaky and cunning and it's mm -hmm. dangerous because he knew something was up. 
He just didn't know what it was. I had to become very, very um, two-faced because I had to carry on sort of the way that I was. I mean, I was already two-faced because I was thinking things and feeling things and never expressing them. So at this point, I was probably (laughs) three-faced because not only was I doing all the right things and making all the right noises to keep him quiet and placated, now I was planning our escape which yeah. meant I was living a third life, wasn't I? So the only way to get out of this, if you don't have anywhere to go, if you can't just pick up your kids and get in the car and go to your mom's or go to your best friends or drive one state over to your uncle, like whatever the situation is, if you don't have anybody and you don't have money. Like if you have money, everything is easier, really. Yeah. You can just, you can go find an Airbnb for a month, you know, and just yeah. hide out. So if you have those support systems at your fingertips, absolutely use them. Like get in the car and go. Accept that all your stuff is going to be trashed before you come back. Just accept that. It's just stuff, you know. Take what's really important to you and get out. If you have money, you have your own bank account, just splurge on something and go someplace safe and take the kids and go, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have those two resources, just do it. If you were like me and you had neither of those resources, it is infinitely harder. So then you have to start thinking of other ways. I started freelancing with writing assignments and Mm -hmm. I started putting money away and I just did it for six months and I did it all behind his back. And that was what I did. Um, And then once there was enough, I ended things with him properly Mm -hmm. and that was it. You know, my son and I left. Uh, if if that's not something you can do, then I would suggest you go to a church. Or a, there's plenty of hotlines for victims of domestic violence and abuse because this is domestic abuse. It's yes. financial abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. Sometimes, definitely psychological abuse. Um, reach out and see what they can do to help you. They might be able to arrange some kind of housing for you where they will Mm -hmm. literally come pick you and your children up if you have them and they will escort you safely sometimes with the police but again this all requires planning this all requires reaching out being honest about the situation you're in and then um being being ready to go if they say okay you've got to hang in there for three weeks you have to play the game for three weeks until you can leave and that's the nerve wracking time. I had a nerve wracking six months, yeah. but um, that that's that's the only way to do it, really. If you can't go to a family or friend and you can't, you don't have your own money to count on, then you have to get smart and start planning. You've got to get creative. Yes. And if you can't do it by yourself, you don't have those resources, reach out to people who do have, do know what to do. Yes. And um I think that's, that's the only way, that's the only way. And it's dangerous. If he had figured out what I was doing, I don't want to think what might've happened to me and my son, but um, at some point survival kicks in and you just, you just figure out that this is what I have to do. And so that's what you do. Uh, I don't recommend it. (laughs) It is so (laughs) stressful. It's so stressful that last six months. But it was all worth it now, now that we left just over a year ago, my son and I left. So uh, that six months of utter stress and worry and just feeling was so incredibly um, just uh, like, like, a, like an undercover spy, you know? yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. just deep, deep cover. Uh, I, I, I would never want to do it again, ever. So that's why when women can't leave or they get overwhelmed at all the things they have to do in order to leave or they think I don't have anybody I don't have any money I can't go Mm -hmm. I'm telling you you can you really can I did but you have to be realistic if you cannot just up and go if you have to save some money if you have to open a secret bank account if you have to work under the table if you have to go around behind his back and get help that way and make arrangements to escape. Just that's what you have to do. And there's no shame about it. And there's no guilt about it. It's at that point, it's honestly survival. And that's what you do. So 
that's what you do. I, I think that is wonderful advice. I think there's so many people out there that are in narcissistic relationships and they need to hear what you, you have to say today and just being aware of the red flags and then making themselves think, you know, wait a second, I think I'm in a narcissistic relationship or they know they're in a narcissistic relationship, but they don't know how to get out of it or they don't know what the next step is, you know, or they're mm -hmm. fearful of it. You provided a, a whirlwind of knowledge today. Now you had to sum up everything we talked about today and you want mm -hmm. to emphasize on it and a couple of important factors. What are some of the things that you'd like to share today? I think there's a big uh, danger right now because the word narcissist is a very, it's a buzzword on social media. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to remember that every narcissist is a jerk, but mm -hmm. not every jerk is a narcissist. Um, and the big difference between narcissists and a jerk is that the jerk will at least acknowledge what they've done. They'll have some crappy reason for doing it. Or um, if, if you present them with evidence, they'll fess up. If you say, look, I know you cheated on me. Here's a photo. They'll go, okay, fine, whatever. Yes, you caught me, whatever, get over it. The narcissist, you can present them with recordings, text messages, screenshots, you know, a signed sworn statement from the woman he's cheating with, and they will categorically deny it. So I think it's important that if you're in a relationship that you're not happy in, or it's unhealthy, because this person constantly lies to you or cheats on you or shouts at you, mm -hmm. that's an unhealthy relationship you have to leave anyway. Yes. That isn't necessarily a narcissistic relationship. So right. I think it's really important that the nar we have to understand that a jerk is somebody you walk away from, fine, you realize that's the thing to do. With narcissists, the manipulation and gaslighting and head games is so next level that it's not that simple. Leaving a narcissist is so much harder than leaving a jerk. Yeah. And so what I have to say to your listeners is if you're unhappy in your relationship, I hope it's with a jerk. I really <laughs> do. Because if it's with a full-blown narcissist, then it's just that much harder to come to the realization of what you're dealing with. So if you're honestly feeling um, afraid in your relationship, like not disrespected, not pissed off, mm -hmm. literally afraid, then chances are you you are dealing with a really toxic personality, not an idiot. You're not mm -hmm. afraid of an idiot. You're pissed off with an idiot. Yes. But if you're afraid of your partner, like if you're afraid to even be yourself around them, open your mouth around them, you are probably in a really toxic relationship. And that's a whole different level. And so anything that I've said today about preparing to leave that is that much more complicated. And um, if somebody is actually listening to what I'm saying and relating, I am so sorry because I know how hard it is. And I want you to know you can do it. Reach out. All those people that you've become alienated from or he's isolated you from, reach out to them again. Tell them what's going on properly for the first time. You know, really be open. Ask for help. Pick up the phone. Call a domestic abuse hotline. Um, save up some money. If you have any money anywhere, cash it in, take it, get yourself out of there. Because right now you think you can't function without him. And I'm telling you, the only way you will ever function again is without him. Please yes. believe me when I say this. So um, just please, please, my advice is if you're afraid of your partner on any level, and just because there's no physical violence doesn't mean that you shouldn't be afraid. Everybody thinks, oh, he doesn't hit you. It's not that bad. Yes, it is. The, mm -hmm. the emotional abuse is horrible because it, you can't think straight. If you're afraid, please, I'm begging you, please reach out to your, even if you haven't talked to your friend in two years, please just tell her what's going on. If she was any kind of friend at all, she'll, she'll have your back. I, I, she, she really should. I hope so anyway. I think that's great advice. Now, mm -hmm. tell everybody a little about your books and some mm -hmm. of the services you provide. Oh, well, my books are, are quite, um, well, I mean, I guess they're, some people think they're quite graphic, 
sort of smutty romance and some people think they're very middle of the road smutty romance <laughs> I guess it depends on your on your smut factor what you can handle yeah. but um yeah they're, they're quite explicit in some ways but they're contemporary romance and they're very much based in modern reality so I deal with things like people coming back from a war zone, trying to, to readjust to life in the United States. Um, I deal with people who have been hurt, stalked, abused, trying to go into relationships, people dealing with sick relatives or they themselves are sick and negotiating health issues with a relationship. Mm -hmm. So my, my characters are very challenged in a lot of ways, the way that we all are. Yeah. But they figure out how to be vulnerable with the other person, how to be open, and then they're heard and respected, and then they can move forward in a healthy relationship. The exact opposite of what I've just been talking about for the past hour. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I don't I don't glorify or glamorize unhealthy, toxic relationships. I know some modern romance does. That's not really my thing. Even before my ex, that was never my thing. Right. Um, so yeah, so I, I've, my series are sort of broken into different themes. So I have a sexy cowboys series. I have an MMA fighter series, motorcycle club, ex-military bodyguards, dive bar. And my final series is um, people who've returned from a war zone with mm -hmm. some kind of serious physical injury, like they're amputees or they're really scarred. They're dealing with uh, how to accept their new body and enter a relationship with somebody who sees them whole and beautiful for who they are, as opposed mm -hmm. to who or what they are not. So there's a little something for everybody. If you like your motorcycle club boys, I've got you covered. If you love your bodyguards, I've got you covered. <laughs> 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 I love it. I love it. And where can people find you? Uh, the best place is my website, which is marisoljames.com. I have just started a YouTube channel. So that's another place where you can go and see all my, my, uh, my son is doing all my promotional videos. So if you want to take a look at my YouTube channel, it's just Marisol James. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I have just joined TikTok at my son's encouragement. So um, I'll, I'm on all of those places. So I would suggest maybe people stop by my YouTube channel to get some idea of what the different series are like because my son's done a pretty good job on the promo videos I love so it. yeah that's what I would that what I was that's what I would suggest that in my my website where you can sign up for my newsletter see all my books uh there are links to all my books on Amazon through my website so that's probably a good place if you're interested in looking at my books and starting on a series I would go through the website if you're curious sort of what my series kind of looks like and the vibe of it, I would check out my YouTube channel. I love it. I love it. Well, this has been amazing, Marisol. I'm so glad you came on the show today. I love the topic. And I yeah. think you're going to be helping many uh, people that are in narcissistic relationships, you know, with this, with this discussion. And I commend you for being able to have the courage to leave the relationship and to actually start a, a beautiful, new, healthy life that you're living today. And you had mentioned earlier, you're much happier now than ever before outside the relationship. And I think that's something that people have to remember. And so I, I thank you so much for coming to the show and thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stacy. I'll see you again in a little while. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Yeah, take care, Stacy. <laughs> bye-bye. Bye-bye.